And then you sit there, you watch games, you wonder, can I do this still? I haven't been out there on the field. That's the human nature of it. Drew Locke to Lisa Salters after that enormous win. How great is that? Also, how real is the Eagles' trouble and the Lakers' new banner? But never mind that. Courtside for it, Golden Doodle Brody. What's up, dog? Let's go around the horn. What's your name? We didn't execute. Um, I don't think we're we're all we're uh, committed enough. I don't think we're committed enough. Jalen Hurts is he calling out the team? And to that effect, what's the bigger problem for these ten and four Eagles now? The defense or the offense? Defense couldn't stop Drew Locke from the two minute drill, but that was some big time passes, big time catches to go 92 yards. And then on the other side, the offense, no answer, unable to crack 20 points or mount that game-tying force overtime field goal of their own. It had Hurts shaking his head. It has Kevin Clark around the horn right here. Those questions and this. How big is the trouble these Eagles are in right now? Jalen Hurts is right. Three layers of bad news for the Eagles. You demote your D.C. in mid-December. That's bad. You promote Matt Patricia, who is not well-liked nor good at being a D.C. That's also bad. Then the worst news of all, that's not the biggest problem. Jalen Hurts is turning the ball over uh, at an unprecedented rate for him. The point differential is worse than basically all but three teams in history for a 10-4 team. Mm. This team is not going to beat the San Francisco 49ers. They're just like the Cowboys. They are clearly on the second tier. They got to figure it they out. They got to figure it out. It seems to, to think that you don't even think there is a fix to this team. I'll get back to you on that. Israel Gutierrez on what you heard from Hurts after the game and what you saw with this team. Well, I'm generally just confused by what Hertz was saying, too, because who was that message to? It just seemed kind of general and maybe to the entire team. It doesn't seem like a lack of commitment when you're talking about turnovers from the quarterback, whether it be mm. interceptions or, or fumbles lost. And so that's a little bit concerning. But it does have to do with this offense more than the defense. If you look at who they've lost to, the, the idea that they can't get past 20 points, the order of which they've, they've won a couple of games against AFC opponents, but then against the NFC, against the Seattle team that's fighting for a play playoff spot, all of a sudden, Philly does not look as good. And you start wondering, is it the offense or the defense? No, it's absolutely the offense. You've got to put up more than 20 points in a game if you want to be that feared team in the NFL. And so the answer is, can you stop the turnovers? Can you be a quarterback that goes from doubling his fumbles lost so far this season than any, any other season or turning the uh, turning the ball over uh, interception-wise twice as many as he did last season? Can you stop that if you're Jalen Hurts? You're going to have to because the answer starts with you. It doesn't start with that defense. Harry Lyles Jr., hearing Hurts question the commitment of the team how'd you hear it yeah uh, to me that is the biggest red flag out of any of this whether you want to blame the offense or the defense because to me Jalen Hurts is somebody who knows commitment ever since he came out of high school and whether we saw him at Alabama whether we saw him at Oklahoma or, and even as a Philadelphia Eagle he has gotten better as a player every single season and overcome every single obstacle that he has faced in his career which has been basically every obstacle that he has seen so for him to go up there then and question the commitment of his team, and you noticed he very visibly looked up to make sure people caught that he was saying that, I feel like he was trying to get a message out there and have, I don't know who specifically on that football team to hear that, but he was very pointed with what he was trying to do, which is also surprising for him as somebody that seems like is very orchestrated and, and painted well when he goes up and talks to the media. So he knew what he was doing. So you heard that as leadership then? Cordy Cronin to you, 10 and 4 teams. Usually that things are doing all right if you're 10 and 4. Where are the Eagles right now? In a very weird place for a 10 and 4 okay. team. Mm -hmm. This is some unprecedented behavior where you've got a December switch at the defensive play caller role, which, you know, certainly last night they made a lot of improvements. They were good against the run, by and large, on a per-down basis. And when you think about what they did up until that final drive, they kept Seattle in check, 90 yards until halftime, yeah, three, uh, just three points. And on top of that, it felt like that pass rush was able to keep Drew Locke in 
check, something it wasn't able to do against Dak Prescott, against Brock Purdy. But speaking to Jalen Hurts here, and to Harry's point, that was calculated. This is somebody who has played in a ton of big moments throughout his career. He's a son of a coach. That's not a message that's just directed at the offense. That's directed at this entire team. And the Philadelphia Eagles feel like they're in free fall right now. I know that they can still have control based on the tiebreaker scenario for the NFC East. But right now, they've lost it. And they've lost it because of their own doing. The offense hasn't been playing great. Two interceptions again from Jalen Hurts. And really, he's gotten no support from anywhere, any other elements of this team, offense or defense. Evan Clark, back to you. Talk to me about fix for the Eagles. Is there a path to fix here for you? Well, it's such a broad problem. I was watching some of the tape this morning. It was communication miscues. It was Jalen Hurts bailing from a clean pocket. I just don't know how, where you begin because the, the problems are so broad and generic. I believe they have good coaches. They have good players. They can get better than this, but not as good as the 49ers. The tush push, even last night, the tush push was flagged before said pushing of said tush because the movement of the ball from Jason Kelsey, who has snapped, I don't know, I'm just going to throw out a number, 100,000 snaps in his career over college and bros. This one got flagged. Why? Because it was the week after Tony, and now there's triple the number of offsides on the offense in the NFL. Real quick. True lock after the game was a thing of beauty. I loved the emotion showing what it is to really feel like I still have a career here. But the Seahawks, Courtney, are 7-7. Seven and seven. Is that a playoff team? Yeah, I mean, not, necess not necessarily right now because they're 7-7. Seven and seven. They're out of the playoff picture. But I will say what Drew Locke said was really poignant. Remember what happened to him last year. He got COVID in training camp, and he did it. He kind of cost himself the opportunity, which Geno Smith was able to see. So when he's talking about you have those moments where you wonder, can I still do this? And then to go 92 yards on a two-minute drive and that incredible throw to DK Metcalf, incredible catch, and then the throw to Jackson Smith and Jigba for him to win that game. It's a really cool moment, and one that I don't think the Seahawks are going to forget anytime soon. Remember, they have to figure out what they're doing with Geno Smith beyond this season because his contract and the base salary becomes guaranteed fifth day of the league year. This is something and to Harry consider. Harry Jr.? Yeah, Tony, just real quick kudos, honestly. One for to Drew Locke for how great he did play on that final drive because James Bradbury, those two passes that he got to DK Metcalf on, those were well-defended plays. He just made a better pass, and there was a better catch in, the, in those plays. And the last three weeks, for as much as we talk about how bad the state of backup quarterback play is in the NFL, the last three weeks on Monday Night Football, four quarterbacks that started the season as backups all got wins. Last year, Good Geno Smith had a very empowering message when he said, people roll me off, I didn't write back, you know? Well, it's, Drew Locke could say the same thing. What a QB room Seattle has. Seahawks over the Eagles. Maybe that would be a matchup in the playoffs. We'll put pause on that for a second to our next story. Tom Brady on Instagram. Some poignant comments about the quarterback position. Pointing fingers at quarterbacks and coaches. After Gardner Minshew's pass to Michael Pittman Jr. put him in a vulnerable position for DeMonte Casey's hit. Latest on Pittman, he's seen the concussion protocol. The league suspended Casey for the rest of the season and postseason. Brady writing, we need better QB play and better coaching. It's not okay for QBs to get the receivers hurt because of their own bad decisions. Courtney, does Tom Brady have this right? Is it QB's fault? There's a lot of truth in what he said. Quarterbacks often make these very dangerous throws over the middle of the field. Sometimes they'll lead receivers into dangerous coverage. But on top of that, the situation that the Colts found themselves in in second and eight, there were two deep routes down the field. I'm never going to fault a quarterback for taking a deep shot. But the type of hit that DeMonte Casey led with here, those are the ones that the NFL has been trying to eliminate where the defender led with his head into the head and neck of another player. So you really can't justify that but of course a quarterback can be better about where he's putting his receiver in the line of fire with and that's something Gardner Minshew can certainly learn. Harry Lyles Jr. how'd you hear Tom Brady there saying it's on quarterbacks? I think it's sort of a useless exercise to try to place blame anywhere because just because of the nature of the game like we are talking about the most athletic the strongest the fastest people on the planet in a very quick space where things are happening fast yes you could place blame on the quarterback 
You could place blame on the defense. Obviously, the way KZ played that, like, you probably could have played that differently. But also, I mean, for Tom Brady to make this comment, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall to watch Wes Welker read that comment on Instagram. Because this is just, there's no perfect science to this. That's why, to me, I, I just don't understand. Okay, the but or maybe those experiences informed Brady's opinion here, right? He's talking, well, maybe, yes. maybe he knows in the past, this is what I did. Or maybe he knows coaches are <laughs> tightening those windows to throw balls in now. Go ahead, Harry. I was going to say, but just the this idea that, uh, to me, the tone that he came from, which was the coaching is worse, the quarterback play is worse than when I played the game for you to use that as your reasoning for this, I think is out of line. Mr. Gutierrez, how about you? Yeah, I think there's plenty of blame to go around in a situation like this. You can just look at Gardner Minshew's actual throw and say, not the decision, but the throw, and say, hey, it was deep. Pittman had to dive for it. That put him in more harm's way. But there's only so many pockets on the field that you can make these throws. And while I do believe that, you know, Gardner Minshew and any of these quarterbacks can make better decisions, I would like to hear from the wide receivers because, Tony, believe it or not, there are wide receivers playing in today's game that played when Tom Brady was in the league. And if they tell me that these other quarterbacks are being more, you know, uh, sort of loose with their throws and putting them in harm's way, then I'd believe them. But right now, Tom sounds like a typical retired guy, just not very good and doesn't feel I, like I th it's I thought watching. you guys would uh, appreciate, of course, his, his expertise in this and his freedom to speak on this because he lived this experience. Kevin Clark, to you. Yeah, first of all, Tom just broke the record for a back in my day. He hasn't been, been retired a full I year. <laughs> um, but having said that, I'm with Tom on a lot of this stuff. He uh, Listen, they led with the head. That's a flag. The suspension, to me, is a bridge too far. It's a really hard play to defend. It's physics. Mike Mitchell, a former DB current coach, said on Twitter after, afterwards that essentially you're going to be able to coach wide receivers to make diving catches over the middle of the field, and it's going to be an unguardable play. I think there's something to that. I understand trying to take the head out of the game they've said that many times but I also need everybody to understand the middle of the field is not a free place and defenses will impose their Harry Lau Jr. I'll give you the last word here after the horn. I think one thing to just keep in mind with all of this I think it's great that they're trying to remove these types of hits and plays from the game but given the violent nature of football it's going to be impossible to completely remove it and that's why again I feel like trying to place the blame completely one place or another is useful. I think he's trying to place the focus on the coaching and the quarterback, so people don't just see it as a defensive player issue. Because everything you just said is true. It's part of the game. We'll take a break. Fire Cell next. Will he or won't he from the NFL? Here's Aaron Rodgers. It was unrealistic to think that I would be uh, 100% uh, to be medically cleared um, at any point during the regular season. Um, I do feel like... Uh, you know, in the next three to four weeks, uh, it would be very possible to get to 100%. Rogers also telling Pat McAfee that he will play next year and beyond. Cronin, how do you hear Aaron Rodgers today? In a very obvious sense that he was never going to be able to play this year, I kind of wonder why he ended up going back to practice only for the inevitability that he's not going to be back on the field. But I heard a lot about 2024. He called Robert Sala a fantastic coach. They're going to end up running it back with this group, Robert Sala, Aaron Rodgers, Joe Douglas, because nobody, Aaron Rodgers included, wanted to be playing behind that offensive line that got Zach Wilson knocked out of the game. Harry Lyle Jr., I love how he dropped in there that in the next three or four weeks that he would be 100% because that's not realistic either, dude. Like, like this is this was never going to be a thing. I just want Aaron Rodgers to get healthy. I want to see him next season. I want to see Robert Sala and all them run this back so we could actually see what this looks like instead of just talking about this thing that was never going to happen in the first place. Yours? Yeah, I think they were, you know, it's obvious that science has caught up to Aaron and he wasn't going to be able to, to do this and come back and play. But in all seriousness, when it comes to the Jets, him hearing news that he last year, next year won't be his last year, I think it's great news for the NFL. I think it's great news for Jets fans because, let's be honest, we can mock them all we want for what they've suffered through. But this was supposed to be the year and it's been tragic for them. So having multiple years of Aaron Rodgers at least, Aaron Rodgers at least gives them hope. Clark. Can I just say, this is far more real than I ever thought it was going to be. When we first started hearing this in October and November, I thought, okay, he's doing it for attention, but he's out on the practice field. He's making throws. He's taking reps. He was playing scout team DB last week. So I think this was him inspiring himself 
This was him trying to get on track for 2024, yeah. and it sounds like 2025. So I'm buying this as a story where he proved himself in a way I didn't think was possible. And I think that's okay, right? He inspired himself. That's okay. Everybody's got jokes. I get it. Understanding the person involved. But the legacy of this may be the speed bridge surgery may be the new Tommy John, and that may be the Aaron Rodgers surgery of Achilles. We'll move on. The should they or shouldn't they of the basketball world. Lakers unveiling their in-season tournament batter. They did it 20 minutes before the game. Everyone in attendance got batter t-shirts. The batter was half the size of the championship batters there. LeBron called it awesome. Lakers lost to the Knicks. Harry, did the team do too much, not enough, or just right? They hit all the right notes. The banner looks different than all the other big postseason world championship banners of this storied franchise. Like, I know people wanted the Lakers to mess this up, right? But listen, this team has won 17 titles. They were not going to mess this up. And they had to acknowledge it because this in-season tournament has to matter. So even if the Lakers didn't want to do this, Adam Silver is going to make that call. Hey, make something happen because this has to matter. Did Harry Lyles say world championship banner for an NBA championship. Someone by the name of Noah Lyles The banner say that, though. I didn't that. do that. <laughs> the banner say that. Israel Gutierrez. Do they? No, it was perfect because they did exactly what I wanted them to do. They made it black. They made it different than the other ones. They made the, the yellow letters. And it's obvious that they're just going to put whatever year every time that they win it rather than put up another banner. So I think it's a perfect uh, situation. Kevin Clark? Yeah, this was pitch perfect. There's an element of fake it till you make it with this where we're trying to tell everyone this is a big deal. A banner is part of that. You celebrate the wins in life, and that's why you are all invited to my banner raising ceremony for Around the Horn Rookie whoa, of the Year. Later whoa, whoa. <laughs> all right, don't get ahead of yourself. Uh, Courtney Cronin. Sorry, I don't like it. Uh, they hung it in a spot where they've said they wouldn't hang division championship banners, but yet it goes up next to the actual championships they've won. And this was apparently a league priority. Adam Silver pushing this through, yet notably absent last night. Adam Silver. Mm, okay, I take from Cronin. I had a look just to make sure. Harry Lyles, you are correct. They say world championship on the banner. Uh, for the Lakers, you get your points back and more. We'll move on. Buyer sell three. John Morant's return tonight versus the Pelicans. I'm wondering if you think he's going to be right back to where he was. Top 10 player in the league. Israel, your expectations for Morant. And at 6-19, can the Grizzlies get back in the mix? Uh, I still think Morant will be great, all-star level. I don't think they'll be able to get back in the mix. Do you know who the 10th place team in the West is right now, Tony? Golden I'll State. save you the trouble. It's the Phoenix Suns, oh. okay? It's the Phoenix Suns. You know they're going to get better. Houston might slip out of that top 10, but it's going to be very difficult for Memphis to make up seven and a half games, especially with the depth that they have. It's not very good. Kevin Clark? Here's the bar to clear. They're the worst offense in the entire NBA. They will get better, but they will not get good enough to make the playoffs. I'm selling uh, too, too little too late. And the second question, do you believe Morant gets right back to being top 10, Kevin? Yeah, yes, yes, I, I, I do. Um, I think that he just got that, that skill level, but I just don't think it's going to be enough Cronin, to you? make it matter for this year. Eventually, yes, they get their offensive engine back, but that's not going to fix the bench scoring issues that this team has had. They will get back on track, not only when they get John Morant back, but they're dealing with a lot of injuries. So let's see when Marcus Smart comes back. Let's see about Luke Kennard and Derrick Rose to see the full collection of all Our that loves. talent. A regular season push to get into the play-in is not unrealistic for this team. We've seen how great they can be during the regular season. But my hope is just that John Morant gets through the season, still looks like the player we all saw that he could become and still could become better because he truly was one of the great stories we had in the NBA prior to last season. Mm -hmm. Cronin. Israel Gutierrez, thanks for your time today. Lyles versus Clark, is this for a world championship? We'll see. Showdown next. <laughs> Junior Kevin Clark, good luck in showdown. The famous Toastery Bowl, where Hilltoppers came back from 28 0 down to win 38 35 in overtime. This game had everything. It had two one handed touchdown catches, it had tears of joy and tears of loss, and it had guys eating dry white toast, and then snow angeling in said toast, and throwing said toast in the air like there were no repercussions. Harry, what was your favorite part? My favorite part was for all of you people that say we play too many bowl games. This had everything you could possibly want. Entertaining football, a 28-point comeback, guys doing angels in toast and eating just random pieces of toast. I'm the winner of this game. Clark. <laughs> 
Yeah, my favorite part was the Toast Angels. We need to start stacking these bowl games, marathons of bowl games, with food. And then you make it at home. You have the mayo bowl after the toast bowl. Put them together, make a nice little sandwich. <laughs> Where do you come down on toast? Does this need to have butter on it? Jam or is dry white toast okay to snow angel? And these are questions we never even thought we'd have to answer. We'll split the point, move on. Showdown two. As we mentioned, the Lakers unveiled their banner for the in-season tournament. At the same game, courtside, was the golden doodle Brody. Brody has one million Instagram followers, six million TikTokists, TikTok followers, excuse me, and sat next to Kevin Bacon and Kira Sedgwick. Kevin, fair or foul for a dog to sit courtside? Fair. I'd love an emotional support animal during some Magic games. But listen, LeBron was in train wreck with Matthew Broderick, who was in She's Having a Baby with Kevin Bacon, and now Brody knows LeBron. That is just three degrees hmm. of separation. All right, Lyles Jr.? I mean, it's absolutely fair game. I want to know who thinks that this isn't okay, right? Like, who doesn't look over and see, oh, my gosh, look at this dog having so much fun at this game. But can I also note that this dog has had a better seat at an NBA sure game than I have ever had? I don't know how I feel about that. Kevin Clark played <laughs> the bacon game, which gets you a point. But also, bacon, 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 bacon for Brody. Bacon, good dog. Take the time, Casey. Wednesday is National Signing Day, one of my favorite days of the year. Dylan Raiola just flipped to Nebraska. It's great news for college football fans. But I have one piece of advice for all of us who love recruiting. Do not tweet at recruits. Do not contact them. Go back to your job. Don't be weird. It's so easy not to be weird on National Signing Day. Clear the bar. Easy for some of us not to be weird. We'll see you guys tomorrow around the horn.